one. Welcome, everyone. Um, I hope you can uh, hear me correctly. Lynn, please nod yep. if that is the case. Thank you so much for checking with me. It is my pleasure today and uh, in honor, I also must say, to introduce Dr. Lynn Morris. Um, Lynn has been a, a long time uh, friend and colleague of mine uh, working on uh, age of a vaccine. Uh, she is uh, playing many roles uh, in uh, working for uh, uh, the detection of uh, uh, humoral responses in uh, the vaccine clinical trials. She's uh, also playing a, a crucial role in characterizing the antibody responses uh, that uh, are um, developing into during the natural infection uh, to AJB. The major goal of uh, her research is really to understand uh, uh, the strategies that we can use to develop uh, the critical uh, vaccine uh, um, uh, regimens that can induce broadly neutralizing antibodies. And, and the other aspect of our research is to develop a, a new broadly neutralizing antibody that can be used for passive uh, protection. Um, she will uh, give us uh, today a wonderful uh, presentation on all these aspects that are crucial uh, for us to curb the current uh, HIV pandemic. Um, other than research, uh, Dr. Morris is also holding um, a position uh, in the academic institution at the Wits University and uh, also has major roles uh, in uh, uh, the National Health uh, um, Council in South Africa. I'm not going to say, I, I will say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I know that you are from all over the place. Uh, for you, uh, if you have a question, please uh, check the right side of your uh, web um, link and you will see there is a chat and QA. Uh, please put click on the QA and then you can type in your question. Uh, Lynn, uh, it's a pleasure. Please go ahead and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Thanks very much, uh, Guido. Um, it's really delightful to be here. I know that um, it would be much nicer to be somewhere all together, but, uh, you know, we have to, um, yeah, I guess uh, we live in uh, strange times and we have to make a plan. So I'm very glad that we can all still stay in touch and communicate and share ideas and um, new knowledge. So as Guido mentioned, I'm based in Johannesburg uh, in South Africa. I'm at the University of Witwatersrand. Um, and all the work that I'm going to be talking about has been done at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases um, of the National Health Laboratory Service. So um, I'm going to um, uh, talk a little bit about HIV. Well, I'm going to talk mostly about HIV, but also a little bit about SARS-CoV-2, since that is you know, the thing that is uh, occupying most virologists uh, at the moment. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about HIV in that context. But I am mostly going to talk about HIV vaccines, um, where we are and about some of the, the new concepts. And then I want to talk about um, passive immunization. Um, as Guido mentioned, one of the things that we've been very focused on is, is identifying broadly neutralizing antibodies. And, um, and about how these can be used for particularly, and I'm going to focus on HIV prevention and tell you a bit about the AMP trial, the antibody mediated prevention trial. And then talk more broadly about the use of BNABs and so the BNAB pipe, pipeline and what's, uh, you know, what's coming. And throughout the talk, I really want to reflect on some of the lessons we've learned and where we're going to next. So... First of all, just to look at these rather grim statistics of um, the number of deaths caused by um, COVID and by HIV AIDS. So as you can see on the, on the top graph, in the first uh, six months of this year, we've had more deaths than we had in the whole of last year from, uh, you know, due to COVID. So 2.4 million versus 1.9 million. And that's clearly a trajectory that uh, you know, we, we want to stop. And very fortunately, we can because we now have um, vaccines to COVID. 
And so we really hope that uh, this trend is going to, you know, is going to start going in the other direction. And, uh, and thank goodness, because we certainly wouldn't want COVID to look like HIV and AIDS. As you can see, over the 40-year history, we've had 36 million deaths um, from HIV. And in fact, at its peak, so if you look at uh, around 2004, 2005, we were having the same number of deaths as we had last year from COVID, about 1.8 million people dying every year from HIV. But uh, fortunately, that has been coming down, as you can see, and that's because of antiretroviral therapy. But we're never going to get to, to zero with uh, antiretroviral therapy. And what we really do need is we need a, a vaccine for HIV. And it still is an urgent, an urgent uh, priority. So the other thing that's really striking about these two graphs are the colors. And as you can see, that uh, HIV is really um, primarily a problem in Africa. And I guess that's my other concern, is that it is going to be neglected unless we really um, you know, keep uh, our focus on trying to combat, on trying to combat uh, HIV. So, um, I, you know, this, uh, the, just watching the, the, the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, for those of you who perhaps have been involved with uh, HIV vaccine development, um, as I have for, you know, over 25 years, um, and to just watch it how quickly um, we've been able to make vaccines to COVID has, has just been uh, remarkable. Um, as you all know, that literally within two months of having identified the virus, it was a phase one trial started. Now, they didn't obviously start from scratch. Um, they were able to use a number of existing platforms, many of them, you know, developed for HIV, and they were able to, to really rely on those and to repurpose them for, for COVID-19. And uh, there's hundreds of candidates in preclinical and early clinical development. We've already had 32 uh, be, uh, undergoing efficacy testing, and we have eight uh, approved for use, emergency use. Um, and of course, this really is in stark contrast. So after 20 years of HIV vaccine research, we've done seven efficacy trials and we have no approved vaccines. Now, I certainly don't want to give the impression that, um, you know, that HIV is easy. It's certainly not. Um, and, uh, and so it is worth just reflecting on, you know, why it's been so much easier to make a vaccine against uh, SARS-CoV-2 than HIV. So one of the main things is, is, is the immune response, is that it's an, SARS-CoV-2 is an acute infection. The body uh, effectively clears the virus um, through its effective immune response. Whereas in HIV, um, we, first of all, we, we don't have um, a, a good immune response um, and, the, and the virus integrates into the DNA. And so then it becomes very difficult to, to, to dislodge. Um, we also know that HIV is a moving target. Uh, it's a highly mutable genome, whereas SARS-CoV-2 is relatively stable, less stable than we thought it was. You know, when it first came on the scene, people were saying it's, um, you know, it's a pretty stable virus. But as we've seen now with all these variants arising, that it is, um, it is mutable, uh, but uh, not as mutable as, as HIV. Um, but the main thing really is the antibody response. So to SARS-CoV-2, most people develop very good cross-reactive neutralizing antibodies. And this is both after infection and after, after vaccination. Um, and um, as we've, you know, we've seen, you know, the, 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 these antibodies are, are really critical in, um, in, in um, fending off the virus. Whereas in HIV, only some people develop broadly neutralizing antibodies, and they'd only do so after many years of, of infection. And also these antibodies need extensive somatic hypermutation in HIV, whereas the antibodies, the effective antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 actually require little to no mutations. Also, the antibody response to SARS-CoV-2 is very focused um, to, uh, to the spike protein and just a few epitopes, whereas again with HIV, it's much more complicated um, and there are multiple targets uh, on the HIV envelope. So, um, but just to reflect on, you know, where we are with HIV vaccines, um, this is just a graphic um, I took from, from AVAC, just showing over the 20 year history of HIV vaccine development, you know, the number of efficacy trials that have been done. And as you can see, we have had what they call a surge of activity in the last couple of years, but really, you know, this is a very, you know, a very narrow pipeline, very, very few trials have been done. And actually disappointingly, as you can see, there are, a lot, there are a lot more crosses than there are ticks. Um, 
So those of you who um, you know will follow this field will know that we we had one signal with a vaccine that was tested in Thailand called RV144. It uses a canary pox vector and a and a envelope protein um, boost. Um, and there was a signal in that trial, and I will just mention that in a minute. Um, and on the basis of that, um, they we we did a, a large efficacy trial here in South Africa called HVTN702 to really try and replicate the success of RV144. Um, and unfortunately, the trial the results of that were just released a few months ago, and uh, and and we failed to get a signal in that in that trial. And that was certainly an extremely disappointing. Um, you know, result. Um, we still have one efficacy trial in the field, the HVTN705, uh, and we await the results of that. But but really, in terms of actual vaccine trials, uh, that is the only one right now that um, you know that that uh, is is um, we're hoping for a signal from. So the other two that's in the green box are not actually traditional vaccines. This is um, uh, uh, antibodies, uh, neutralizing antibodies for passive immunization. And you will see I do have a tick there. Um, and again, there was a signal there, and I'm going to talk about that in, in more detail as well. So, but just to reflect on the RV144 vaccine trial. So these are results from, you know, from way back in 2009. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a, it was a canary pox vectored vaccine with the protein boost. And uh, as you can see, the, um, you know, the, the fewer infections in the vaccine arm, um, and uh, it was overall, after the, the three years of the trial, there was a 31% efficacy. And um, the, uh, the, the, the correlates analysis showed that non neutral and to everybody's surprise, I should say, you know, the, the, the correlate of protection was non-neutralizing antibodies to the V1, V2 part of the HIV envelope, um, 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 part uh, of, the, of HIV. And so, as I said, they took this vaccine and modified it to try and um, replicate it, but also to improve on it. And there were a number of changes that were made um, in the South African trial, and um, uh, that I'm not going to go into too much detail about, but it did include changing the, the vaccine, uh, the inserts on the vaccine. Um, and uh, so this trial uh, called Duhamba, which started back in October 2016, uh, was to evaluate the 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 efficacy of of this canary pox uh, vaccine and the subtype C um, uh, GP120 in just over 5,000 uh, seronegative uh, South African men and women. Well, maybe I will just mention here. So, in addition to changing the the um, sequences in the vaccine, they they modified them to match the subtype uh, in South Africa, which is subtype C. So, both the vector and the protein. Um, inserts were changed to better match um, circulating strains in South Africa. But the other thing that changed was the was the adjuvant. So in the RV144 trial, we used alum, and in this trial, we used MF59. So, so you know, some uh, fairly major um, changes. There were also additional boosts in HVTN702. And again, you know, the rationale for this was to test whether non-neutralizing antibodies are potent enough to achieve vaccine efficacy of greater than 50% for at least two years. And as I mentioned, uh, very disappointingly, um, this uh, vaccine trial was actually stopped early um, because, um, as you can see, there was, no, uh, there was no difference between the two arms. This was published just a couple of months ago in the NEJM. And so, of course, we're all now scratching our heads, you know, wondering what, uh, you know, what could be the reason why we weren't able to replicate this. But as I mentioned, you know, there were many differences between these two vaccines. There was the adjuvant difference, um, the sequences, so the swapping from clade A, B in RV144 to clade C. There were additional boosts, but there were also other important differences. So the, 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 the virus genetics in the, pop, in the, the countries that we're testing also um, showed different levels of divergence from, um, you know, from the vaccine strains. So basically, clade C viruses have, are more divergent. Also, the host genetics obviously are very different. Also, very different host factors, different levels of HIV exposure. And another very important thing, um, and this comes from a, a previous trial using the same clade C vaccine, um, showed that, in fact, this clade C version did, in fact, induce lower levels of V2 antibodies, which were the correlate. Of course, we don't know what the real reason is why we're not seeing the signal. And obviously, there's going to be work done on this trial 
to figure out, you know, what the reason is for this um, vaccine not showing efficacy um, as it did in RV144. So we certainly await, the, await those results. But as I mentioned, we do have one vaccine um, still, in, uh, still in efficacy trials. Um, it's an AD26 vaccine. And here the insert is in fact a mosaic. So it's designed, it's a sequence that's designed to increase coverage of all the different subtypes. And then there's also um, a clade C uh, envelope protein. In this case, it's a GP140 rather than a GP120. But this vaccine is still um, designed to elicit non-neutralizing antibodies. And the rationale for this um, regimen is that uh, it showed very good protection in non-human primates due to um, non-neutralizing antibodies. So again, we wait, you know, wait the, uh, the results of this trial, which are expected next year. Um, in fact, there's two trials, one in, the, in Africa and one in the US, um, and um, we should get the results in the next uh, couple of years. But, um, you know, of course, what we really want is a, for a vaccine to do is to, is to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies to HIV. I think there is a general acceptance that while, you know, non-neutralizing functions are important, to really get the whole way, we really need an antibody that neutralizes the virus. That's certainly the most potent way to, um, to stop uh, virus infection. And so there's been a lot of work done over the years by many groups, and I, I haven't captured them all here because it really has been an active area of research from many, um, from many different uh, groups um, to really understand in these rare people that do develop broadly neutralizing antibody, what, what exactly is the process? And there's been very detailed longitudinal co-evolution studies looking at the virus and the antibody and looking at the changes and really trying to, you know, understand and pinpoint what it is about, you know, this process that, that in some people produces broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, and as I said, it takes years. And so these have been very long-term studies, intricate, detailed studies, and also, in fact, been in some cases been able to identify the very original B cell that gives rise to these broadly neutralizing antibodies, the so-called unmutated common ancestor, and then following the, 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 the progression to, to breadth. And if we can understand this process, then perhaps we can design a vaccine that emulates or stimulates a similar process uh, through vaccination. And so that's really the basis of this kind of new generation of HIV vaccines um, that are being, and there are a number of them, and I'm just highlighting a few here, you know, some of these new concepts that are now being tested. And many of these, well, in fact, they're all in phase one clinical trials, human clinical trials. And some are really showing some quite promising results. So the germline targeting um, approach, which really is designed to stimulate um, B cells that give rise to CD4 binding site antibodies, and having designed a very specific immunogen that, that, that Basically, it's a lock and key, you know, going and finding these rare B cells that can give rise to CD4 binding site antibodies, very carefully designed proteins and, and, and um, nanoparticles. Um, and in fact, these have been into humans and in fact have been shown to, to fish out these very rare B cells. But, you know, the next step, which is to mature those B cells to produce uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies um, and secrete high levels of these antibodies is, of course, the next challenge. Um, there's also a very exciting um, fusion peptide from Peter Kong and colleagues at the VRC. It's a short peptide that, again, is able to elicit a particular kind of antibody. But again, you know, the process of maturing that response is something that, um, that also um, is, uh, is being tested. And then, you know, a major... Um, you know, a major advance, and this is a number of years ago now, by John Moore and Rochia Saunders, was being able to, um, to, to basically make soluble versions of the HIV envelope glycoprotein. So, so that's the complex, the, 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 the tricky part about, um, about the HIV envelope is that it is, um, it's really uh, six proteins all coming together, and it's, a, it's very conformationally mobile, and it's also covered in sugars. And so it's been a very tricky protein to work with. And so um, people, number of pe people have now been able to devise ways to make soluble versions of these trimers. Um, and indeed, when you put them into animals, these trimers can elicit um, neutralizing antibodies. 
However, again, here the limitation is it's only to the autologous virus. So it's not, they're not broadly neutralizing yet. So as you can see, we're making some progress. There's still way and you know, some way to go. But people are also trying different things in terms of the um, you know, the immunization approach. So one of them is, is really to try and replicate what we see in infection, where the immune system is seeing slightly different versions over time. And so this idea of sequential immunization where we would have to give multiple vaccines in order to shepherd the immune response down the path to give a broadly neutralizing um, antibody response. Of course, that's pretty complicated because it means you're gonna need different, you know, different immunogens and um, there's obviously manufacturing issues there, but just the, con the, the it will be important that we can just test the, the, the concept. Um, and then of course, there's also this idea of let's not overload the immune system Let's rather just uh, expose it to small bits of antigen and again, slowly, um, you know, build up um, to um, to give larger quantities. So, um, so yeah, so lots of novel ideas. Um, and I should just say, um, you know, people people are also, and this is where I think the 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 exchange between COVID and HIV is really is really interesting. That you know, people are now, of course, also looking to the mRNA. Uh, 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 vaccines that have been so successful with COVID and trying to adapt some of these as well uh, for HIV. I should say actually that the Moderna vaccine originally was being developed for HIV. Um, and so it is it is um, very exciting now that um, that some of these concepts are, for HIV are going into, into the mRNA space. And, and, uh, and I th certainly think something like the sequential immunization where you need to change and make lots of different things. You know, this mRNA platform is very amenable to some of these concepts. So, so I think it's an exciting time in the in the HIV vaccine field, even though these are only in phase one and we still have, you know, some way to go. But hopefully, you know, what we've learned from COVID will really help us as well. So now I want to talk about um, passive immunization, which is um, basically um, infusing broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, so it's instant immunity. And these would be infused before or shortly after infection. Um, and one of the advantages about antibodies is that they are highly specific um, and they're less likely to have um, you know, safety or unexpected side effects. And certainly we have seen that. Um, it's been very little um, issues using uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, in humans. Um, the other thing, of course, about, um, about using antibodies is that they can be engineered. And so you can modify them either to be more potent or broader, but actually more importantly to have increased half-life because one of the, the downsides of this approach, of course, is it's short-term immunity. This is not long-term immunity, You're basically giving antibodies and then they just uh, de you know, decay. And so if we can um, uh, increase the half-life, and I'm going to, you know, I am going to talk about that. But you know, of course, this is not a new concept. Convalescent sera has been used for over a hundred years to treat infectious diseases, but obviously, it's been polyclonal uh, sera. But here, what you know, what with new technologies and being able to identify individual B cells and pull them out and um, you know, clone out the antibody genes and express them in bulk, you know, it's been a, it's been a major um, uh, you know innovation in terms of, uh, of, of this kind of um, approach to, to health. And, and actually, you know, developing antibodies is um, one of the fastest growing areas um, in, um, uh, in health is, uh, is the use of antibodies to treat both infectious and, and other diseases. So, um, so I want to just tell you about the AMP trial, um, which is a trial that I've also been, been involved in and results also just came out a couple of months ago. So this is the first trial of a, of a neutralizing antibody uh, to prevent HIV infection. Um, it was an incredible trial, um, really, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that they were able to carry off a trial of, of this size. And um, um, it, uh, so the, the, the antibody that they're testing is VRCO1, which is an, a broadly neutralizing antibody to the um, CD4 binding site on the HIV envelope. And of course, that's essential for the virus in order to enter cells. So you're therefore blocking viral entry. It was isolated way back in 2010. And, you know, I think that's also, you know, took uh, 11 years, I guess, to get this antibody all the way, um, you know, to, to, um, to, to um, get the result from a clinical trial. And again, you know, contrasting with COVID, how we've already had 
a number of antibodies um, uh, developed very quickly and and tested and shown to work. Um, and again, I should say that relying a lot on, on the expertise that had been previously developed uh, for, for HIV. But so this antibody VLCO1 neutralizes um, a large number of global isolates in vitro. Um, and it's also been shown to protect non-human primates from high dose challenge. And obviously that's an important uh, you know, rationale for going ahead for the trial in humans. Um, but of course, as I mentioned, you know, antibodies have, have a short half-life, and in this case, VRCO1 is, has a half-life of just 12 days. So as you can imagine, uh, you know, multiple infusions are, are needed, and that's exactly what, um, you know, what this trial is about. So there were, in fact, two trials, the HVTN704, and I should say this was a very strong collaboration between the HVTN, the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, and the HPTN, the HIV Prevention Trials Network, um, came together to, to do this trial. So um, the, H, uh, the, the, the 704 trial in the Americas, um, and then the trial, and that was mostly in, in um, men who have sex with men, and then in the Africa trial, it was in high-risk um, women. And um, as you can see, there were two, uh, two uh, um, doses, a, a low dose, 10 milligrams per kilogram, and then a higher dose, 30 milligrams per, per kilogram, and then um, a control arm. So three arms, two active arms, and uh, one control arm. So 4,600 individuals were enrolled, and they came every two months to be infused with VRCO1, so a total of 10 infusions. Um, and uh, so as you can see, the study took, uh, certainly the individuals were enrolled for about two years, um, and the whole trial took about four years to, to run. So I'll cut straight to the, the chase that, um, that there was no overall prevention efficacy in either of these two trials. Um, so the top just shows 704, 703, and then the bottom is the pooled. And in fact, we pooled all the analysis because there really was um, not much difference between the trials. And you can see that uh, for the low dose, the high dose, and the pooled, uh, there was no prevention efficacy in either of those groups. Um, but what um, we did do uh, is that we were doing real-time sensitivity testing of the viruses in the in this trial. So I should just um, maybe just to remind uh, to remind people about the numbers. Um, so there were um, uh, there were 67 infections in the in the placebo arm and 107 uh, in the in the pooled arm. And so we were doing these uh, real-time assessments of the sensitivity of the breakthrough viruses to VRCO1. Um, and so um, we identified, and this was with uh, Carolyn Williamson and Jim Mullins, who were doing this, uh, pulling out the transmitted founder viruses, and we were generating pseudoviruses and testing them in the TZMBL assay, and then testing them against VRCO1. And our hypothesis, you know, was that, uh, you know, that breakthroughs in the VRCO1 arm would be because the viruses were naturally resistant, and indeed the, there is uh, natural resistance to VRCO1. Whereas in the placebo arm, we would see mostly sensitive viruses, as most viruses, um, you know, are sensitive to this antibody. We also, and I'm not going to get into any of this, but um, lots of uh, sequencing to, um, to look at um, timing and uh, escape mutations from, from this antibody. So, um, so as I said, we were measuring the in vitro sensitivity, and we were able to do that in 162, so 93% of, 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 of all the endpoints. And we had pre-specified the sensitivity of these viruses um, to less than one microgram per mil. So those would be the, the sensitive viruses, and then those that were intermediately sensitive, one to three, and then the resistant viruses in purple. So as you can see in the um, placebo arm, and so this is just the naturally um, circulating uh, levels, is that, you know, only, well, 19, so about 30% of the viruses were sensitive at this level. So I think that's important to, to remember is that this is a very stringent, uh, you know, one, one microgram. But as you can see in the two active arms, there were far fewer sensitive viruses. So only four and five in the, in the, um, in the two, in the two active arms. Um, and so when you put that in a, in a table, um, you can see then that, um, that we saw a very high level of efficacy uh, to the sensitive viruses. So you can see 75% efficacy in the viruses that were very sensitive at one microgram per mil. We, we saw no um, uh, impact 
or no um, efficacy in viruses that were intermediately uh, uh, resistant or were, or were completely resistant. Um, but we certainly saw this signal in the most uh, sensitive viruses. So this is just another way of looking at that data. So these are the this is the sensitivity of all the viruses um, in um, in this trial, um, and this is their IC80. So this is the concentration of VRCO1 that you need to um, to inhibit this virus in vitro. Um, so if you look in the blue, the uh, this is the and as you can see, there's a big range of sensitivities that to VRCO1. So some viruses. Um, are very sensitive, and as you can see at the top, uh, greater than 100, you know, some are naturally resistant to VLCA1. But you can see, you know, there is a, a broad range um, um, uh, 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 of sensitivities. And then in the two active arms, uh, what you can see is that there's far fewer viruses below the one microgram per mil uh, dotted line. Um, and that's because those are the viruses that were blocked um, by VLCA1. And so when you take the median values, um, we, you know, we calculated that viruses from the VRCO1 cases were 2.4 had 2.4 fold greater IC80 than viruses from the placebo arm. So, in other words, more resistant viruses in the in the VRCO1 recipients, which is really what our hypothesis, you know, was um, that was the basis of our hypothesis that indeed um, the, the antibody would um, prevent um, um, these viruses would select for resistance. Now, the other important thing that, um, that the AMP trial um, can tell us is what is the level of VRCO1 that you need to protect against infection? Um, and so this graph shows the prevention efficacy versus what's called the ID80. So this is the inhibitory dose um, of, the, of, of VRCO1, and it is to the circulating strains. Um, and as you can see, that uh, the, as, as the ID80 goes up, uh, so does the, um, the prevention efficacy. And so to get 90% efficacy, we will need a serum titer of about one in 200. Um, and if we had only had a titer of one in 32, we would only have 30% efficacy. So, you know, this is really important in terms of thinking about how much antibody one needs to protect against HIV infection. And obviously important as well for thinking about vaccines and how much, um, you know, how much antibody a vaccine needs to induce in order to provide protection. But the other very interesting thing is that we had a, a lot of historical data from non-human primates that, that we, we already knew that the amount of antibody was um, uh, correlated with the amount of protection. And when Peter Gilbert and colleagues then um, modeled on the, the data from the non-human primates, you can see that it's, and that's the line in blue, you can see that it's it's pretty close. So it's a pretty good uh, estimate, the non-human primate model. I mean, it's on the upper bounds. So um, uh, so it would be a one in 83 tighter to get 90% efficacy in, in non-human primates. And perhaps, you know, this was a bit surprising too, in the sense that, you know, non-human primates, we generally do high, you know, high dose uh, challenge. So it's a lot of viruses that um, they're having to protect against. And I think it has given people some pause for thought you know, about how much antibody we might need to protect humans, where we know that naturally transmission is really due to, um, you know, one or two viruses. It's not, uh, it isn't a whole a whole swarm that get across the mucosa. So it has also given us some uh, some things to, to really think about. Um, so the implications of AMP. So the reason why we didn't see a big signal is, is as, you, as you saw, using that very stringent criteria of one microgram per mil, of you know the, the the sensitivity of the of the virus to VRCO1, that actually only 30% of viruses that are circulating are sensitive at that level, and so really what that tells us is that we need a more potent antibody, and we need a combination to increase the efficacy of this approach. Um, and as I said, you know the the realization that protection will require fairly high levels of serum antibodies, and that's obviously both for um, passive immunization, but probably also for vaccines. But you know the other thing that AMP has done is it has validated our in vitro assays and our non-human primate models, and that's really important because it means that we can use the in vitro and the and the NHP data to model and to and to plan for our next trials. It means we can trust the the results that we get. In the lab, um, in order to design the the next uh, you know the next uh, trials, 
Um, another very important thing, and I mentioned early on, you know, there were two trials and we ended up putting all the data together. And that's because antibody efficacy was independent of gender, population, clay, dose, or route of acquisition, because the two trials were different in all of these things. Um, you know, the one trial was in in men in the, in the US, uh, where the route of transmission is um, uh, homosexual transmission, whereas in the um, in the um, uh, in the, the Africa trial with women, it was heterosexual transmission, and also the ten microgram and the thirty microgram, there was no difference. So, so really, um, um, so I think that was also an important uh, an important outcome. So, um, you know, overall, AMP didn't show efficacy, and so you know, one of this is should we be disappointed? And Bruce Walker wrote a nice editorial that accompanied um, the publication of this of the AMP trial results. He called it a half, a glass half full. Um, and so I think it does depend on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. I'm certainly an optimist, and I see that we still have the other half to fill to get to the full potential. And indeed, we have that possibility, because I think we need to remember that VRCO1 was never intended as a product. It was just the first antibody that we had. Um, and we've got the signal that we need um, to show that BNABs can work. And, uh, and what that means is that we can now test the better BNABs that we have, because the newer ones are 10 to 50 fold um, have better at neutralization than, than VRCO1. And we also know that combinations work really well. So there's certainly lots of scope. So I think getting the signal has been really a, a very important step. Um, and, um, and it's really allowed the, you know, the, the, the field to, to move forward. So, um, so VRCO1 targets the CD4 binding site. Um, as you can see there in the green. So there are other antibodies um, that are better, a better CD4 binding site antibodies. So VRCO7523, um, uh, and the LS means it has these mutations in the FC part of the antibody to increase its half-life, and that's undergoing clinical trials. Um, and there's other CD4 binding site antibodies as well that are also being tested. Um, there's also antibodies to the V1, V2 apex and the N33 glycan. These are different sites on the HIV envelope trimer that are targets of broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, and, um, and I'm going to just talk a little bit more about the CAP256 antibody because it is an antibody that I've been involved in um, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, but just to also say, you know, there is this robust pipeline in addition to, so those antibodies that I was just talking about, they're all in clinical development and they're all being tested um, in combinations now. And there's, I'm not going to go through all of these lists, but um, but in, a, in addition to the, uh, the LS mutation, they're also, they've been modified to improve some of their other properties, particularly their manufacturing properties. And so that's what all these other numbers are. Um, so sometimes it is the same antibody, but just modified um, to improve some of its uh, properties. Um, and then just also to mention that there are also um, these multi-specific uh, um, uh, antibodies, in, in other words, antibodies that have, um, uh, that have been engineered in order to target two epitopes. And I think those are also going to be pretty exciting, although you know, we need to see what their PK looks like in order to see how, um, you know, how well they, they um, you know, how long, how long they last in um, uh, once they've been infused. But uh, I'm also just going to briefly talk about the, um, the HPTN-130 trial, uh, sorry, HPTN-130, HPTN-039, which is um, a phase one trial that is, um, will be starting soon, um, that, uh, in, well, in September, and it uh, is testing three antibodies in those. I know there's four there, but it's a combination of three of those. And then I also want to talk about the Caprisa trial, which, as I mentioned, is an antibody that I have been involved in. So the CAP256 antibody was isolated a number of years ago from a woman in KwaZulu-Natal. And the reason why we're excited about this antibody is because it's very, very potent. Um, and I've just shown it, shown it there, showing that it's, and this is going, I guess, the higher up, the more potent. Um, and just showing the high level of potency of this antibody against clade C viruses. It is a very unusual antibody. Uh, it has a very long CDRH3, as you can see there, um, uh, and that allows it to really probe through the sugars on the HIV envelope to reach the, the, the protein underneath to, to affect uh, neutralization. So, um, as I said, it's highly potent, isolated from donor CAP256, and we did this in collaboration with the Vaccine Research Center a number of years ago, it targets the V2 
Um, it's highly effective against clade C viruses, less effective against other, other clades. Um, in collaboration with Dan Baruch, we showed that it protects monkeys at very low dose. So the, low do the, the, the potency that we see in, in vitro actually translates to good um, in vivo efficacy. Um, it uh, has been GMP ma manufactured and it's uh, the phase one trial and the P with the PK data has been completed. Um, but just to say that, um, you know, it's not been plain sailing. So one of the, the things about CAP256, as I mentioned, it has this very long CDRH3 and it turns out it had um, a site that was a target of a protease enzyme that's in the CHO cells. Um, and then Nicole and her team very um, were, were able to figure out that it was due to the lysine and by changing it to alanine, they were able to prevent this, what they call clipping. Um, and very fortunately, it didn't impact the neutralizing activity of the antibody by doing this single uh, uh, change. But what it did do is it delayed the manufacturing by 18 months. So, um, you know, so making uh, antibodies, particularly unusual ones, certainly has its surprises, but we're very grateful to the VRC for pursuing and continuing with uh, the manufacture of this antibody. Um, and so this trial is being run um, in, in uh, South Africa by Slim Abdul Karim. So it's a, the trial started a year ago and it's the first in human to test the safety and, and PK of this antibody. So the V2 actually doesn't refer to its target, it refers to version two after the clipping um, mutation and then LS because it is the long acting version. It's being tested alone and in combination with the CD4 binding site antibody that I mentioned, the RCO 7523. It's a dose escalation study and it's intravenous and subcutaneous. And the subcutaneous part is being facilitated um, really through the use of this hyronidase, which is an enzyme that temporarily um, removes or, or, or um, disrupts the hyaluronic acid that surrounds cells and it allows better absorption uh, and dispersion of, of antibodies. Um, and so just a quick summary of where we are with the trial. We've certainly shown this antibody is safe and tolerable. There've been no major issues. Um, it's PK, fortunately, is very similar to other studied uh, BNABs. We were, we were concerned with the long CDRH3 that it might um, get recognized by the immune system and get cleared, but actually it appears to be um, uh, to, to a very similar PK, nothing unusual. And the predictive model shows that we can maintain serum concentrations um, of, of more than a, a mg per mil for up to 16 weeks. So the, the LS version is clearly working, uh, that it can be maintained. And that uh, a, fa we've, a phase two trial of this antibody has just been approved and will commence uh, later this year. So, you know, one of the things now about AMP is that we can use the, what we know about AMP to think about how effective are these uh, antibodies and combinations going to be. And so this is just some predictive modeling on um, a triple combination with the with VRC07, 523LS, and PGT121, which is a V3 antibody, and then one of two of the V2 antibodies. Um, and they're very similar, as you can see. Um, but uh, so if you look at VRC01, as we know that these stringent levels only hits 30% of viruses. Uh, as you can see, these newer antibodies are better at that. But what's really good is the uh, triple combination. As you can see, we get to 90%. And even if you think about having two antibodies active in this combination, we still get to 50%. But, uh, but clearly, this is a huge advance on, um, you know, on, on VRC01 by itself. And indeed, Yunda and Peter have done some very nice modeling, thinking about, um, you know, that if one in, one in, one, a single infusion of a triple BNAB, how long would people be protected given that we know now what levels you need, certainly from, from AMP, um, to protect people against HIV. And in the green is the is VRC01, and in the yellow and the blue is the two doses that are going to be tested in this HPTN trial that I mentioned, um, that's starting in September. And as you can see, we can maintain uh, efficacy, and it's a median uh, average efficacy of more than 90% for up to 16 weeks. And so that's really a game changer in terms of thinking about using antibodies for prevention if the single doses can last, you know, up to four months. So what does the future hold? Well, um, you know, I think we mustn't lose sight that HIV still prevents a formidable challenge. Um, and uh, that, um, but, and as we, as we have shown now that BNABs can prevent HIV infection, the AM trial has shown that. And so, 
uh, you know, the, the, the use of BNABs for, for passive immunization, if it's used, and obviously this needs to be in targeted groups, but it is, um, you know, uh, being seriously considered. Um, uh, and given that, you know, that a triple combination can protect people for, and, you know, up to possibly even six months um, after a single uh, infusion, you know, that does um, change the, the game a bit. But I think what else is really important about AMP is it has provided a strong rationale for pursuing BNAB inducing vaccines. And as I've shown, there are many exciting BNAB concepts in phase one, in phase one trials. Um, so with that, I just want to thank this fabulous team that I work with at the NICD and specifically to, um, to mention Penny, uh, Penny Moore, who's um, sitting next to me in the front row there um, for her leadership during this time, um, particularly also uh, taking the lab, you know, on the COVID journey, which uh, has also been very um, exciting. And, uh, and yeah, I guess uh, feeling like as a scientist, you know, one can really make a, an immediate impact and, uh, and, um, and deal with, uh, with current crises. Um, but really to thank all of the team and also Nono Mkise who ran the AMP trial in our, uh, the, the, the neutralizing antibody part of the AMP trial in our lab, but, but really just a fabulous team. And also all our fabulous collaborators that are all listed here from Caprisa, from UCT, from Duke, HVTN um, and HPTN the statisticians um, and the Vaccine Research Center, but actually most importantly to thank uh, the AMTRAL participants for, uh, you know, for coming and uh, being infused every two months. That's quite a commitment. Um, and also, of course, all our funders who, um, who believe in what we do and continue to support us. So with that, I'll hand back over to Guido. Thank you. Lena, this was a, a fantastic presentation and overview of where the field stands uh, uh, with the uh, research of a new vaccine and, and prevention strategies using uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies. And uh, I already have a few uh, questions from the audience. I'm going straight uh, uh, to them, uh, trying to reorder them uh, just to follow a little bit the your presentation and, and the first, uh, considering uh, just the uh, issues that we face to implement a vaccine, in particular for COVID around the world, is uh, from Margaret. How has the route of administration of HIV vaccine candidates impacted the immunogenicity and safety? Um, well, I would say, I mean, most of the, the, the vaccine candidates have been um, tested just um, I guess, uh, in, you know, intramuscularly. So I don't think we've done an extensive analysis of different routes of administration in HIV vaccines. I mean, probably not for most vaccines, actually. But I think, you know, again, um, you know, that uh, COVID is also, I think, showing us the way. I know a lot of people are thinking about, you know, intranasal administration of vaccines, because I, you know, I do think that a lot of the vaccine hesitancy that we're seeing is because people don't like needles. And so, you know, maybe we do really need to move away from, you know, from thinking about the traditional way of, uh, you know, of, of immunizing and, and thinking more broadly about, you know, how can we get these, these, anti or these immunogens into people's bodies with the, and, and I, I guess to get them to the right, the right sites as well. You know, this idea that to follow the route of infection. So, um, you know, that to, 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 for the vaccine to, go through the same um, route as, a, as, the, as the virus itself, might be able to stimulate better immune responses at the mucosal surfaces. I, I guess people are thinking about that too with HIV, you know, thinking much more about the mucosal immunology um, in uh, uh, HIV. Um, thank you. And uh, uh, just to follow up on RV144 and the 702, uh, one question is, uh, how do you think of the no neutralizing antibodies uh, uh, we're able to confer protection. Yeah, well, look, the correlates analysis, you know, suggested it was V2 antibodies, and there's other analysis too. You know, the CIV analysis also pointed to, you know, to V2 antibodies. Um, and so, and we certainly know from, you know, animal studies, and we do know from other human studies that, that you know, that non-neutralizing antibodies are effective. I mean, they certainly are, but I guess... Um, you know, as the point I was making, I think to get the whole way, you know, we do need to have a neutralizing antibody. So I think, um, 
you know, perhaps the RV144 signal that we got was the best it will ever get. You know, maybe that's the 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 sort of the the realization that that's as good as we're ever going to get with a non-neutralizing antibody. And you know, perhaps that's what the 702 has told us that um, that even that is quite hard to achieve. You know, it, you know, we need um, um, you know, and again, I think this the 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 difference between the vaccine and the circulating strains could play a role in this. That it was probably easier to protect in in Thailand. Probably their levels of exposure were different. The levels of inflammation, are, you know, are different in that population. So there's, you know, it might be that, um, you know, that they that they certainly were responsible for that protection. I mean, the correlates, it's not a mechanistic correlate, but it's certainly a correlate. Um, and, uh, you know, so um, I, I guess uh, the, 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 can we push those antibodies even further? And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure we can. And I guess that's why I also I'm a you know also a firm believer in let's try and make a neutralizing antibody vaccine, which is sure. Yeah, uh, it, it it makes perfect sense. One uh, question uh, was uh, about uh, you mentioned the fact that it was not really a, an influence about the population in the AMPA trial, so you were able to combine. Mm -hmm. Uh, the trial in the U.S. and the other, mm -hmm. but one uh, of uh, our um, participants wonder if there was uh, any effort to define uh, impact uh, uh, related to pharmacogenomics, and, uh, and uh, he refers to major histone compatibility complex uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, impacting uh, the immunity and the uh, pharmacorelevance of the infusion of these neutralizing mm -hmm. antibody. So, you know, we haven't, as, you, as I said, we haven't actually seen that. And I guess even looking at the PK, you know, it's been pretty consistent, actually. You know, most, most um, you know, there hasn't been big differences in the PK between different, um, you know, different people and different, you know, the different population groups. Um, so, um, so it's probably less, less likely to have a major impact than it would in, you know, in a vaccine trial. Um, yeah, and I think the data suggests that, that these are not um, major factors um, in uh, how well these antibodies are going to work. Sorry, I'm, uh, you're, I think you're muted, Guido. Yes, uh, I, I was. Uh, um, so uh, let me go for a second to a, a different question uh, here. Um, uh, could it be possible that the inefficacy to produce a vaccine using amber proteins or epitope residues um, is it related to the inability uh, to uh, develop a neutralizing antibody similar to, uh, I, I'm not sure what the syncytin is uh, in, uh, I think she's referring to tolerance of uh, um, of the barrier as producing the neutralizing antibody. So, right, right. Which, so the, which was yeah. one of the original. Mm. Go ahead. Yes, that that we kind of almost yeah, um, uh, uh, trying to fight ourselves and um, so I mean certainly and you know this from the work of uh, at Duke with with Bart you know that um, that some of these antibodies are auto-reactive and so this idea that we are trying to make a you know an antibody against something um targeting our you know i guess ourselves and how um you know that uh, that could explain why it's difficult to induce them but um you know i think there there's certainly enough you know indications that you know there's strong uh, it, you know, there's, there's strong responses in other individuals. You know, we, we, we know some people do make broadly neutralizing antibodies. And so I think it's something a bit more um, complex than that. There's something we're not understanding about either antigen presentation um, or, um, you know, whether it is about, uh, the, it is something about the, the virus itself, you know, that there needs to be a particular, you know, epitope presented you know, to really stimulate the right kind of B cells. So, you know, I think I think it's much more about about that than the, than about an autoimmunity uh, um, aspect. Okay, and uh, uh, time is running short. Uh, I have a question, but I'm gonna uh, go for the question posed by Mahendra. 
uh, it's uh, knowing the prevention, uh, but it's very interesting to, to bring it up. Uh, uh, is uh, could we go for monoclonal antibodies as a drug uh, for curing AIDS? So, you know, I think, and people certainly are looking at this, you know, to use antibodies uh, as cure. And I think they have some interesting, um, you know, properties that could make them, you know, potentially uh, quite effective. Um, and, uh, you know, they're able to um, find cells that have, you know, small amounts of antigen displayed on their surfaces, for instance. They can, you know, they, they can be sensors to go and find those few infected cells. But of course, we know that they engage, you know, through their FC receptors with, um, you know, with, uh, with other cells, because ultimately in cure, you want to be killing cells that are latently infected. And, you know, so whether you can then recruit, you know, that other arm of the immune response through the use of, of antibodies. So I think it's an interesting idea. I mean, I think antibodies for prevention, as we know, you know, we've shown some success and that's certainly going to go ahead. You know, I think antibodies for treatment are where it's a bit less clear of how useful they would be. And I think we're already seeing, you know, how easy it is for the virus to get around, um, you know, antibody pressure. I mean, they, um, you know, just, uh, you know, can mutate. So I think antibodies for prevention, I think, is a bit less clear. But I think antibodies for cure is something that, um, and I know a number of people are, you know, looking into this. I think I think there are some interesting aspects. I mean, it's certainly a different modality to some of the other drugs that people are testing in, you know, for, for cure. Um, I think they do bring another, um, you know, ad additional uh, aspects. Um, okay. And uh, uh, I'm going to go for uh, one of the questions. Uh, we are talking about prevention, and we know that there are, we have uh, drugs that they can be used in the context of uh, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. How do you think we should... Uh, uh, target uh, these uh, uh, current strategies by complementing them, maybe with the delivery of uh, the monoclonal antibody that you have discussed uh, in your presentation? Yeah, so I mean, how you use them, of course, is the next question, you know, that, uh, I mean, assuming the triple combination is going to work, um, you know, how, who would you target? And, and clearly, it, it needs to be done, people who are at high risk, you know, of HIV. And so, you know, identifying particular groups so young women, for example, in South Africa is the group that we're focusing on. So there's certainly, you know, a time where these where young women are at extremely high risk of getting HIV. Um, and so if they could, you know, have this this treatment, maybe it's even just for a for a few years, um, you know, that to, to get them through that high risk um, kind of phase. But it could also be discordant couples. It could be in mother to child transmission. I mean, I think there's a, a few you know, good examples of where, you know, this approach could be, you know, could be used quite, quite effectively. Um, but in terms of, you know, thinking also, you know, if this is shown to work, you know, we, we you know, we also, people are thinking around how to, for long-term delivery, um, you know, and putting them into vectors. So the AAV vector, for instance, show, you know, can express these antibodies very well. And so perhaps maybe for long-term use, um, you know, we'd have to think about other delivery uh, mechanisms. Perfect. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, do you think that uh, the the current pandemic, the current COVID pandemic, uh, has uh, uh, somehow hampered our ability to pursue the field of uh, HIV vaccine? Um, there are several aspects that uh, we could consider. Can you just uh, mm. elaborate on that? Well, there's no doubt because most HIV scientists are working on COVID now. So, I mean, that is my worry is that we're not going to go back to the HIV issues. Um, but, you know, I do think, though, that we are getting on top of the COVID things. Uh, you know, I think uh, HIV is still the ultimate challenge. And so, um, you know, my hope is that people will come back to HIV with more ideas, renewed energy and um, and to make use of, you know, the lessons that we've learned, um, including, you know, some very practical things about, you know, um, how to, you know, make th do things faster. I mean, it's been incredible how quickly, you know, clinical trials have been run with, with COVID. Um, I think another very key thing that's helped the, the COVID vaccine field is the involvement of industry. Um, and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, the, that uh, that will also change um, going forward for, for HIV. That is fantastic. Um, Lynn, thank you so much for this presentation, but uh, also for all the work 
that you and your colleagues uh, uh, have been doing in the field uh, for AJV and then jumping so quickly and providing so much information about the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, I think we all owe you. And I thank the participant for their um, questions. Um, thank you very much and thanks for listening. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.